marketplace. And so we're uh, privileged to have uh, Tad Hudson here today. He's going to talk to you about uh, maybe opening up your uh, mind a little bit and looking at best practices, not just from what uh, has been in what I call the vertical or endemic business, that which has always been part of the cannabis uh, hydro scene, but looking out at the larger agricultural, horticultural, what's out there in the spectrum of uh, the big picture as we grow into big ag business. So uh, let's bring on Tad. We have a microphone up uh, front. Uh, we would like this to be interactive. So uh, when you have questions, just uh, come on up, stand in front, and we will recognize you. So thank you very much, and uh, let's hear for Tad. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. You guys can hear me okay? Sounds good? All right. Uh, first thing I want to say is there's no need to take notes. I'll have uh, the transcript from how I expected this talk to go, at least, up on our website on kissorganics.com. Uh, it'll be the first blog post. So everything, all the resources and, and everything that I mentioned in this talk, I will have uh, links to on there. So you can just sit back and relax. The whole presentation is not going to use the full hour, so we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end if you have any questions. So uh, the first thing I'd like to start with is I'd like to just take a moment and have you think back and remember the very first time you saw a cannabis plant. Now, for me, that was in 2005. I remember distinctly walking down into this gentleman's basement, and when he opened the door, I was hit with uh, this overwhelming odor, the lights were so bright, I was squinting, it was like being transported into a whole nother world. And there was this sort of power and mysticism about this plant, something that I had uh, never experienced before. You see, I, I grew up uh, with my parents owning a retail nursery and landscape company. I've been around plants since the day I was born, but I had no experience with cannabis. And through this journey and getting to see this plant in person, it really, it really interested me and it brought me to my first hydro shop and my first experience in the hydro shop walking in I felt like I was being transported back to my high school chemistry class there were no plants there were all these bottles on the shelves I'd never heard ever never seen before and I'd been to a lot of nurseries and garden centers and frankly it got me really excited to try them all out and find out you know if I could get this massive growth that they were claiming on a lot of these bottles and uh, I had never seen marketing like this with these you know, photos of cartoonish pictures of beautiful women and these monster plants. Totally new to me and not something that you find in your typical garden center um, or outside in the ag world. Now, throughout this journey, I was fortunate to have people like my father here who uh, taught me a lot of what I know about soil. This is actually after he had washed his hands. They're literally stained like that from years and years of just digging in the dirt. Um, he founded the nursery and then uh, when he sold the nursery, uh, started a compost tea business and that's sort of when I came in around 2005. In addition to that, uh, I was fortunate to have uh, a good background in science and research. Um, I had just gotten back from grad school in Australia and this was our laboratory setup in terms of being able to have a phase contract microscope and take video and actually look at these soil microorganisms up close and, and really uh, delve into what was going on in our soils. Um, along this process, I was really fortunate to meet some really wonderful people. Uh, people like Jeff Lowenfels, author of Teeming with Microbes, uh, Teeming with Nutrients, in his latest book, Teeming with Fungi. Wonderful author. If you ever get a chance to hear him speak, he's fascinating. Wonderful speaker. And these are great books to check out if, if anything in this talk sounds, sounds remotely interesting. Uh, in addition to that, I also became good friends with Tim Wilson of Microbe Organics, one of the foremost experts on compost teas, and some of his works have even been published in the Smithsonian. Uh, Dr. Lang Ingham of the Soil Food Web. My father was one of the very first Soil Food Web advisors, and we, were, we worked hand in hand with her in establishing brewing times for compost teas, you know, whether or not E. coli would reproduce in, in these brews, and things like that. And in addition to that, some other wonderful people like Steve Solomon, Erica Reinheimer, and a gentleman who goes by the online name of Clackamas Coot, who people have started entire businesses and commercial soil mixes around a lot of his concepts and ideas. Then in 2011, we opened Keep It Simple Farm. It's a beautiful property. We have a salmon spawning trail that goes right down um, 
right down along this creek and we give tours to kids on native habitat and there's an outdoor preschool on the property these are our tobacco starts last year we do a you pick um, for the community and also grow veggies organic veggie starts the staff has a lot of fun with their plantings we have squash and corn and, and some watermelon over here um, it's a it's a beautiful property and a great place to work here's one of the giant pumpkins that we grew last year we grow them for the community and they get to guess the weight and then the preschool kids get to come in with their hammers and smash away at it at the end of the season it's a lot of fun uh, we have piglets and pigs goats turkeys bees and we just started baby chick season so I'm very fortunate in the fact that I get to talk to people about chickens and ducks and then the next person in may have a question about soil science or we're talking about apple trees or cannabis. It's a lot of fun. I'm really fortunate to do what I do. And I believe by applying some of these principles that I'm going to talk about today in regards to uh, science and research that already exists in the horticulture and agriculture world, we can dramatically reduce our costs on conventional bottled nutrient programs by up to 70% or more. And that's really what I'd like to talk to you about today. Now, the first thing I'd like to suggest is that you consider going organic. Now, for some of you, before your eyes glaze over, I, I, my goal today is to give you compelling arguments for why it makes sense from uh, both an economic and an environmental, uh, environmental perspective and address such issues as bugs, quality, uh, yield, and cost. So as many people know, cannabis has been in the news more recently. This was from uh, 2016. Unfortunately, uh, public perception of cannabis has been uh, damaged quite a bit by the illegal pesticides and plant growth hormones, things that are not approved for use on edible crops that have been found in some of these, in some of these products. And this is a big concern, I think, in terms of how our industry is perceived. And it's a big issue in terms of safety of our medicine. Now, from an environmental perspective, uh, when we are fertilizing with a lot of these chemical fertilizers, we have to think about where this product's going. A lot of the excess nitrates and phosphates that leach out of the, these soil mixes are going down into our groundwater, which creates algal blooms and dead zones in the ocean, which kills off a lot of marine life. Um, most of these products are made using fossil fuels and are transported all the way from China. So there's a huge cost associated with that. And one other thing I'd like to mention is a, a, a story in regards to uh, my experiences with visiting a few of these 502 farms. Um, many, many of uh, the mineral salts are mixed up in these giant IBC totes and at some of the facilities I, I've visited, I've literally seen them being dumped down the drain into septic systems or sewage systems, literally polluting the groundwater that uh, exists in that area and I think it's not going to be too much longer before we have a huge issue in regards to either the EPA or the state uh, coming down and creating regulations or fining companies for this sort of behavior um, something to consider in regards to how you're managing your nutrient program so before you write me off as a tree hugging liberal um, I'd like to give you some other good uh, good reasons for going organic now from 2015, Consumer Reports found that 24 to 60 percent of uh, higher price for organic produce over conventional produce. Now I know that doesn't directly translate to cannabis production because there's not currently an organic standard for cannabis, but there are companies working on that. Uh, companies like Certified Kind or Clean Green are attempting to unify the industry under a single broad marketing uh, term similar to Omri or any other certification agency so that consumers can be educated and know that when they are purchasing a product it's been tested by an independent agency and is safe for them so they know that they'll get safe medicine and frankly we don't even know all the long-term consequences of what combusting or metabolizing a lot of these chemicals really are um, or what levels may exist in the fi in the final product especially with a lot of the pesticides so I think it's something it's a I think it's a responsibility that we have as growers to provide safe medicine uh, and also for recreational use when people are growing cannabis. And unfortunately, not all product manufacturers have been totally honest with us. I mean, many of you probably remember Guardian Mite Spray, which uh, contained abamectin, but they told us it was 100% natural and organic. 
Uh, I almost used it on my crop because I was handed samples and I just fortunately never, never got around to it. And it was highly effective because it had the same active components as Avid, something not approved for use on uh, cannabis. Um, other products such as Bushmaster and Gravity and Flower Dragon, they contain paclobutrazole, plant growth hormones that made the, made the buds much heavier and denser, so they had more, uh, more weight and more package appeal. Again, not approved for use um, on cannabis production. Now, one of the biggest reasons I think going organic makes sense is it gives you the ability to reuse and recycle your soil. This is huge because you no longer have the cost of moving soil in and out of your facility if you have an indoor facility. You don't have the cost of buying new soil every cycle or every other cycle or the cost of uh, disposing of this. So huge advantages to recycling and reusing soil. Now the first question I hear when um, typically brought up or the first concern is bugs. How do you deal with bugs if you're reusing and recycling soil? Well. We've had growers, organic growers, in soil for more than two years that have had to deal with everything from broad mites, the russet mite, uh, it's a root aphid, powdery mildew, the two-spotted spider mites, uh, fungus gnats, and much more. So I firmly believe with an effective IPM program and preventative maintenance, you can totally keep these bugs under control and manage them. And when I say organics, I don't mean that we're just choosing to live in harmony with a lot of these insects, but we're actually actively and preventively maintaining our garden. It can still be clean. We can still access and use scientific method and a lot of these properties. So don't think that organics means we just chuck science or chuck cleanliness out the window. That's not the case at all or not what I'm advocating. So what does reused soil really look like? Uh, this is a photo that we, uh, one of our growers took. Um, this soil is over two years old. This grower was averaging 1.6 to 1.8 pounds, pounds per light, or about 35 grams per square foot, single-ended fixtures, no CO2 supplementation, um, and that entire bed down the road cost him about $50 in nutrients and media, and that media has been sitting there for over two years. Uh, the process is really quite simple. You literally pull the plant out of the bed, shake off whatever soil is around the roots, and then harvest your plant, and then you'll bring in, every time you harvest a plant, you're pulling out organic matter and you're pulling out nutrients and those need to be replaced. So you can, you can literally add some, more, some high quality compost, about a cubic foot per yard we found is a good recommendation, and then add some of those dry nutrients back into the soil, mix it back in, and 24 to 36 hours you're bringing in your next crop. Here's some photos for some other growers. Again, all of this soil in the photos I'm showing you, all these buds were grown and sold, it's over two years old. This is from Fire Farms down in Oregon. And even if you decide that organics is not the way to go, I hope that you'll at least be open-minded to considering looking outside of your local hydro shop for some of these nutrients. Uh, this is an article that was published in December of last year. A company called Outco hired this woman, uh, Allison Justice. She was coming from the horticulture industry. They brought her in and she was able to switch them from a conventional uh, bottled nutrient program to uh, ingredients that she found and, and was aware of just from the horde industry that had similar MPK values, dropped their cost uh, 22 times over what they were paying before. As many of you know, your expenses are just imp as important as your sales. Now from an organic perspective, it's even cheaper. We found that by recycling and reusing the soil, we've got on an average yield of about four pounds per yard or two pounds per light, which is what most of our growers with CO2 and double ended fixtures are averaging. We're seeing about five cents a gram. Now that includes your substrate and your nutrient. So that's, that's both. And then the following year, you're down to under two cents a gram. Very, very affordable. I'm not, I'm not aware of any other program that can get, can get that low in terms of your costs. Uh, Gold Leaf Gardens is a great example of this type of, of growing strategy. They have a great reputation. They're known for quality. And something that really struck me was uh, a group of people came up to our booth earlier this week and I was talking to them and they recognized the Gold Leaf Gardens video we had playing and I was asking them, what do you think, you know, what do you think of their product? Uh, I haven't been to a lot of rec shops myself. And the first word she used to describe them was, it's very consistent. And I think that's really, really important when we talk about top shelf cannabis and talk top shelf cannabis brands, is that ability to produce a consistent product over and over again that is, that is of high quality and organic. 
Uh, they also make the material for Lair, Lair Canagars, another connoisseur branding. Um, all of that is coming out of uh, organic soil and grown by Gold Leaf, all the material for that. Here's their facility. In their facility, they're using uh, modified fabric raised beds, about a third of a yard per bed. And they're averaging two to three, two to three pounds across all their strains, or about 60 grams per square foot in terms of their yield. They are using double-ended gavitas, and they are, subs they, are, uh, they are supplementing with CO2. So really what our goal here is from an organic perspective is to create a living ecology and uh, recreate nature to the best of our ability in these facilities and in these beds. And that does require a certain amount of soil. That's why they're going with raised beds. It, it's a nice buffer and it allows you to get more nutrients into the soil rather than having to add nutrients constantly throughout the cycle. And they do supplement with things like molasses and compost teas and other ways to encourage uh, microbial growth. And I'll talk a little bit about that here next. So if we can assume that there is benefit to considering growing organically, uh, the next thing that becomes really important is getting good biology and microbial diversity in our soil. This is a photo of cyanobacteria uh, actually creating soil structure. It's these microorganisms, the bacteria and fungi that bond the soil together and create that structure. Really, really important from a plant perspective. Now, an important distinction when we're applying mineral salts is we're directly feeding the plant ionic nutrients. But when we put out organic fertilizer, we're not directly feeding the plant. We're feeding all of these microbial communities. That's the bacteria, archaea, uh, fungal hyphae, um, protozoa, flagellates, ciliates, amoeba, all those microorganisms that you may have studied back in junior high biology class. And in addition to that, the, the plant is photosynthesi photosynthesizing sunlight and it's putting up to 40% of that energy back out through the soil in the form of exudates. And that's things like sugars, carbon, carbohydrates to feed these microbial communities. And those microbial communities are then cycling the nutrients and making the plant available. So if the plant, the plant actually controls this too. So if it wants more phosphorus or more potassium, it can actually control that process by putting out exudates that select for the microorganisms that make these nutrients plant available. And in a natural system, this is the way that the plant receives nutrients. Just to give you another perspective on this, another visual, this is uh, a small amount of our potting soil with a little bit of distilled water and molasses, just to show you what uh, these microorganisms really look like. Uh, what you're seeing here, this is all fungal hyphae. Um, these are all bacteria running around. And these bacteria then are eating up the organic matter and in turn being eaten by other bacteria and by uh, larger microorganisms like flagellates, ciliates, amoeba, and nematodes. And then what they excrete is now a plant available nutrient. So when we put out excess amounts of mineral salts or chemicals, what we're doing is we're destroying some of these, some of these mic microbial communities. And the problem with that is that this is also what helps defend the plant and keep it safe from a lot of the diseases that we face, especially in facilities and indoor communities. Now, there's not a lot of microbial products that I uh, really think are essential to growing cannabis, but mycorrhizal fungi is definitely one of them. Most people by now are familiar with mycorrhizal fungus. It is uh, a microorganism that's been around for more than 450 million, year, million years, but we weren't even aware of it until, I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago and it forms a symbiotic relationship with the roots of our plants. It's one of the primary ways in a natural system that a plant receives phosphorus. Um, and by infecting the plant, it actually provides it with uh, protection from a lot of uh, diseases. It outcompetes certain, um, certain mi other uh, pathogenic microorganisms like Phytophthora and Rhizoctonium and Fusarium for limited nutrients in the soil. And when we talk about when we talk about mycorrhizal fungus, it's really, really important to realize that the ones that associate with cannabis are known as glomus species or endomycorrhiza, and specifically glomus interatices and glomus mossiae are the two that associate with cannabis that are known to. Um, the reason I put this slide up here is because they've recently been reclassified. They can now be called rhizophagus interatices or rhizophagus irregularis. Glomus mossiae is now being called funnelformis mossiae. Just really important, so when you're looking at a package, this is what you want to look for, is one of, these, one of these five terms. 
Now, in addition to be one of the, being one of the primary ways a plant receives phosphorus in a natural system, they've also found that mycorrhizal fungus can increase absorption up to 40 times more for nitrogen, sulfur, boron, copper, and zinc. It also contains cytokinins, jasmonic acids, and salicylic acids, and auxins. And cytokinins are really important for root development. Jasmonic and salicylic acid helps with the plant's natural defense system, and auxins are really important in many different aspects of cellular development. So it serves a myriad of functions uh, beyond just providing phosphorus or nutrients for the plant. So how do we use mycorrhizal fungus appropriately in our gardening practices? Well, it's really a one-time application to the roots directly when transplanting rooted clones or seeds. You wanna make sure that it comes in direct contact with the roots because it's a root symbiont. So personally, I choose not to add it to compost teas or, or with other microorganisms because it may just become a very expensive food source for those. And I don't like to add it in on top of the soil too because it actually needs to come in contact with the roots. Um, for cannabis cultivation, it's really simple and easy to add it in right when we transplant. If you had a tree or an existing bush, you could dig down and do a root injection. Now, what I've talked to you about so far is really uh, nutrient cycling, or it's also known as the microbial loop in scientific literature. Um, it's sort of the biological aspects associated with, cannab with cannabis and plant growth. What I'd like to talk about now is uh, a little, little bit more about the minerals and nutrients associated with the soil. And to do that, I want to tell you about this gentleman here. His name is Steve Solomon. He was the uh, founder of Territorial Seeds and he's written a couple of pretty famous books for our region, including uh, Gardening West of the Cascades, and more recently a book called The Intelligent Gardener. Steve's life is actually really fascinating. In 1978, he moved to Oregon and began homesteading off his land, and then in 1979, he opened Territorial Seeds. And he was doing everything you were taught at the time when it came to uh, organic production. He was using animal manures and compost. He was adding dolomite to sweeten the soil. Everything that we're taught is important from an organic grower perspective. But he found that his energy level over the next few years was deteriorating rapidly. His teeth were starting to fall out, his gums were getting soft, his, his dentist called them wobblers. Uh, his wife's fingernails were actually becoming soft and, and pliable. And he couldn't figure out what was going on. Over half his diet was stuff that he was growing himself right there on his land, primarily vegetable-based, vegetable -based, and doing everything he could to be a, a good organic farmer. Well. Over this time period, he, uh, he decided in, let's see, 1984 to take a vacation with his wife. The business was finally up and running, and they were able to take a bit of a sabbatical with his family. So they left and went to Fiji, where they lived for six months. And over the period of the next few months, he found that his health was improving dramatically. His energy was recovering, um, his teeth, his gums were firming up, and his wife's fingernails were getting harder. He wasn't sure if it was the lifestyle, the wonderful weather, um, he decided to look further into where the vegetables were actually being grown. And he found that there was this valley where they were spraying all manner of chemical pesticides, but they weren't using any fertilizer. And it was on this diet that his health was, was rapidly improving. So he found out that this particular valley would flood periodically by cyclones that would come into the region. And they would, they would deposit at that time a bunch of silt and clay from a local igneous rock deposit um, where an vo extinct volcano used to exist. And then the weeds would grow up to chest height, they would then be tilled in, and then they would plant the vegetables. Again, no fertilizer, the organic matter was coming from the weeds, and they were spraying all types of terrible pesticides on this crop, and yet his health was improving. So he then went back to Oregon and found his health declining again, and started reading the works of William Albrecht. Uh, that were actually published back in the 1920s and 1930s. This information has been around for a really long time. All around the idea of mineral balancing and nutrient density. And in addition to William Albrecht, people like Kerry Reams, um, Michael Estera, Neil Kinsey, and many more have done a lot of research on this, on optimal levels of minerals and nutrients in the soil. So I would like to equate uh, some of these chemical nutrients with the idea of eating a Big Mac every single day for every meal. Now, yes, it contains protein, fats, and carbohydrates. You will grow, but you'll probably be more, more, uh, more exposed to disease and pathogens. Uh, your health will probably suffer in the long term. And one thing that they found with this is by doing a soil test, 
And this little test costs $25. Uh, we, we like to use Logan Labs just because it gives us consistency across comparing all of these tests. Um, this will give us a lot of information, including um, pH, uh, CEC, calcium levels, and all these other trace minerals. Um, again, only $25. And don't take this as the end all. This just gives us an, a rough guideline of where our soil is at. But by knowing, having an idea of what sorts of excesses and deficiencies exist in our soils, we're then able to reamend them and improve them. So even if you're used to buying, say, a commercial potting soil, getting a $25 soil test on that potting soil, finding out if there's anything you can do to improve upon it before planting your plants could have a dramatic effect on your overall crop health. Uh, one example I like to give is organic alfalfa meal. This is something that you can find at your local feed store. It runs around 20, 22 to $25 for a 40 to 50 pound bag of it, so it's really affordable. Um, it contains a small amount of fast release nitrogen. It's an excellent microbial food, so it's gonna increase all that bacteria and fungi when you apply it, all the stuff that we showed in that, that other photo. And it also contains triacontinol, which is a really important plant growth hormone uh, associated with uh, bud production. So for cannabis, it's, it's has a lot of value and rose growers swear by alfalfa meal. You may hear them talking about how they add it into their gardens. Kelp meal is another one that I really like. You're picking up uh, a small amount of nat nitrogen and potassium, but it also contains over 70 different elements. Uh, we've, science has discovered that plants need a minimum of 14 to 16 elements to grow, but recently we've discovered that beyond that, um, Research has found that there's many more elements in the soil that plants are able to use. Um, when we're talking parts per million to par parts per billion. So by having something that adds like a rock dust or um, kelp meal that has a lot of these, these trace minerals in them, it allows the plant to access these um, over time. And kelp also contains a lot of really good plant growth hormones and regulators, things like cytokinins, gibberellins, auxins, some of the things we mentioned before. So here's some just a variety of nitrogen sources that I made up the other day. Just to give you an idea, there's so many more, but these are all things that you can source uh, probably locally. Fish meal, for example, is around 10% nitrogen. It's a fast release source. Uh, alfalfa is one to 2% nitrogen. Uh, neem seed and feather meal are slow release nitrogen source. So you'll get that nitrogen over a period of months rather than a period of weeks. Um, animal manures, cotton seed, and compost and vermicompost contains uh, nitrogen as well. Phosphorus, you have fish bone meal, bone meal. Soft rock phosphate contains calcium and phosphorus. Guanos, manures, and uh, fish hydrolysate that's been stabilized with phosphoric acid. All great ways to pick up phosphorus. Potassium, uh, I found that cannabis really, really likes, really, really likes potassium, so I always like to give plants um, a larger amount. That's why you see, I think, a lot of PK boosters in the industry as well. Uh, but things like kelp meal, seaweed extract powder is quite high in potassium and then um, not organic but potassium sulfate and potassium silicate are other ways to pick it up uh, compost green sand k -Mag, and again alfalfa meal so changing direction a little bit the next thing I'd like to suggest is as growers we start taking a hard look at ingredient lists and seeing what's on the label and anytime I hear from a particular manufacturing company that something is proprietary to me, that means it's not something that I necessarily choose to use on my garden. I want to know everything that's going both in my soil and in my crop, not just for health reasons, but because there may be some potential liabilities down the road as we discussed with some other manufacturers. And we want to know that we're growing safe crops. So keep that in mind. I, I, I hear uh, proprietary, either to me that means also potentially that they're really doing something like using a lot of these ingredients here that we could source somewhere else much more affordably. So let's start comparing apples to apples, which is really, really tough to do when it comes to a lot of these products. Uh, so many companies have mycorrhizal fungi now. Um, how do we compare them? Well, we already discussed how Glomus enteratices and Glomus mossiae are the two that, is, that infect cannabis. So that's a good starting point right there. Uh, Pumpkin Pro is a new one out, but from the giant pumpkin industry, uh, from a former world record holder. It's 300 spores per gram. It doesn't contain trichoderma and five pounds around $60. Now, trichoderma has been found, trichoderma and high phosphorus have been found to inhibit mycorrhizal infection rates um, with a bunch of studies out now, um, primarily out of uh, Florida. And 
by not by not having trichoderma in there, we're giving the plant the best success to make that infection. Uh, mycos is another one, 80 spores to, to 300 spores per gram. No uh, trichoderma, a pound runs about $20. Now we look at great white here, 219,000 propagules of mycorrhiza. That looks, that looks really good on the package. Um, only 83 propagules per gram though of the glomus species that associate with cannabis. Uh, a lot of those propagules up here are ectomycorrhizal, so they typically associate with conifers. Now, I was talking with some people yesterday about this, and there may be some benefit to having ectomycorrhizal fungus in your soil. But um, when we talk about mycorrhizal infection or colonization, we really need to look at the ones that are gonna infect cannabis itself. And eight ounces is gonna run you around $72. Um, Myco maximum here, you're looking at 27 spores per gram. Um, pound is $52. And then this product from Hydro Organics I grabbed was 2.46 propagules per gram. Um, I see in the, in the garden industry, I'll see companies will put uh, with mycorrhiza on the label, on their fertilizer label, and then I go back and flip it over and look on the other side, and it'll be 0 0.08 spores per cc or spores per gram. Not enough to actually get mycorrhizal infection, but enough for them to put it on the label to where the, you know, the ignorant gardener will think that they're getting this, this in addition to everything else in the fertilizer. Now, unfortunately, looking at a label isn't enough. And this is, they found that the, the Oregon Department of Agriculture did microbial testing on a lot of these products in 2015. Now, before I share this, I just want to say that I'm not here to um, promote or, or uh, condone any of these products or say anything negative about them. This is just the research that the Oregon Department of Ag came up with. Um, they found with the Advanced Nutrients product Piranha, uh, they were claiming 234 propagules per gram of mycorrhiza. There was none detected on the label. Same with Trichoderma and Pseudomonas. Uh, OG BioWar here, they claimed 500 spores per gram. Only one spore per gram was found in the sample that they tested. Um, OGT, Organic Bounty, um, Great White claimed 365, they only found 53. Um, RTI claimed 80, they found 42. Santiam Organics and Southern Oregon Bokashi, a million CFUs per gram of Bacillus, they only found 43 CFUs per gram. So I don't know if it's the shelf life of these products and they were sitting on the shelf too long or if they weren't you know, hitting their guaranteed analysis for another, analysis for another reason, but you're paying a lot of money for these products. So if you're using a lot of any of these things, it might be worth doing your own independent testing. Or if there's any product that you're using a lot of, go ahead and spend a few bucks, get some microbial testing on it, and make sure you're actually getting what you think you're getting uh, when you're buying that product off the shelf. Uh, this is from that Pumpkin Pro product. He posts this on his website, and it's one of the reasons I, I like to talk and promote him, is he has this testing. You know, It's from December 7th, 2016. What's actually in his product, it was tested independently. Um, this is what I, like, I expect from manufacturers that are selling uh, microbial products, is that they're doing this testing for you. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask and request independent test lab testing on products like this. So I want to just look at a couple other products to give you uh, some, uh, some other comparisons on costs and value. So Strapped by Botanicare is uh, Blackstrap Molasses, unsulfured Blackstrap Molasses, $45.95 for a two and a half gallon retail. Uh, Bud Candy from Advanced Nutrients, $169.98 for a two and a half gallon bucket. I know at our feed store, this is our prices. Depending on where you live, you may be able to find it even cheaper. We sell a three and a half gallon bucket for $27 and a 50 gallon drum for $225. Um, we're sourcing it out of the egg industry. Again, these are things that if you choose to use them in your gardening, you may just want to start looking other places and see where you can find them. Seaweed, another great thing, like we already talked about all the benefits of seaweed. Um, this is all cold water processed Ascophyllum nodosum, which is North Atlantic sea kelp. Prices range from 56, 55, 56 dollars up to 62 dollars a gallon. Uh, you can buy your own seaweed extract powder for uh, 15 to 20 dollars a pound. It's going to cost you about 20 cents per gallon. If you're buying in bulk, like a 44 pound box, uh, you can get that price down to around 8 dollars a pound, which cuts you down to like five to 10 cents a gallon. Really, really affordable. No reason you can't mix your own seaweed with water, make your own product. You're literally only using a quarter teaspoon per gallon. Chemic acids, wonderful chelators. They bond with the minerals in our soil and help make them plants available. Um, Diamond Black is 6% by content. It runs $50 a gallon. Roots Organics, 0.1% by content. Um, we carry one by Terra Vita. It's around 12 to $15 a pound. 
85% by content. It's a powder. You can make your own for three and a half cents a gallon or less. Um, BioEgg is another company that has really good humic acids that are quite affordable. So just take a look around and make sure you're looking at the labels to see what percentages are on there and what you're actually getting for your money. Uh, the last point that I think is really, really important is have a test garden. I, this will more than pay for itself over time. I can't tell you how many times I meet growers and they come up to me and they're like, oh, you got to try this product. And product X will be this amazing thing. You know, they got 20% more growth over their, over their crop before. And I, I ask them, well, did you have any controls? Like, did you change the humidity in the room? Did you change your watering practices? Oh, uh, no, but we switched, we switched lighting companies that year. So how do I know if it was product X or the lighting or some other thing? Or they may do five different nutrient samples that they picked up at a trade show like today. And then they don't know which of the five actually had benefit. And maybe, maybe four of the five actually were detrimental for your crop. And the fifth one was just amazing. There's no way to know if you don't have controls. That means you have to be able to replicate this experiment over and over again and only change one thing in your growth cycle. So if you're setting up a test garden, that means that one section, and I, I don't mean just one plant. You want to have you know, maybe 10 to 15 plants or an area uh, would receive one change from the rest of your entire crop. So your control can be how you normally grow your plants and then your test garden can be whatever new idea or new thing you want to test. So all of these principles I selected to, I, I mentioned today, those are things you can test out yourself to see if it works for you in your garden. It doesn't have to be expensive. Um, you can dedicate just a small portion of your garden to trying some of these concepts out. But again, really, really important that we use scientific method, experimental design and have controls so we know what our variables are. Now, in terms of whether or not this process works, um, companies like Goldleaf Gardens here in Washington has an amazing, um, amazing brand going. They're known for their high quality cannabis products and top shelf shower, flower, and they get, they get top dollar for what they're growing. Hi-Fi Farms and Fire down in Oregon are two really progressive, um, sustainable and uh, in environmentally friendly brands that are doing a great job also getting that top dollar in the market because people know uh, what they're growing, they know they're organic, and uh, they're able to keep their production levels at uh, optimal levels because they're, they're incorporating a lot of these principles. So these are just some photos, extra photos I have from Fire that they shared with me. Um, all these were grown organically. And just to sum it up, these are sort of the main points of what I wanted to get across to you today. Please consider growing organically. Um, if you do increase the microbial diversity and biomass in your soils, that means using high quality composts or vermicompost. I'm not talking about $20 municipal compost that you get in your local garden center. Um, invest in your soil. It makes a huge difference. And then get a soil test. Know what your nutrient levels and mineral levels are in your soil so you can, you can adjust them and make them optimal for your plant. Uh, look at your local garden and farm store and find out what they have, your local egg supply. You may be able to save tons of money on a lot of these nutrients um, and a lot of these raw amendments. Take a look at the ingredients on the labels so you can start comparing and seeing what you're actually paying money for. And then lastly, try these things out. Have a test garden. Try one thing new. See if it makes a difference. You're constantly learning and evolving. And by working together, we can all share that knowledge and improve uh, a lot of the science behind can cannabis cultivation. That's all I had today. Thank you very much for your time. I believe they, they do have some sort of certification. The, the issue there is that certification has to have value, which means enough people in the industry have to be aware of what that certification means. And the other challenge there is not all of these certifiers are requiring the same standards. So um, you are right that yes, there are, there are certification agencies and Clean Green and Certified Kinder are sort of the two largest right now. 
Um, I'm hoping that one of them will gain enough momentum and do enough marketing to where they can really control the industry so they can start, like Omri would be a great example of that. Omri is just an independent certification group. They're not associated with the government, but a lot of people recognize Omri and uh, consumers, growers, give it a perceived value that allows manufacturers to get a little bit more money for that product and growers know that it's safe. So hopefully with cannabis it'll be the same thing where if you go into a store and see an area that's certified kind products or clean green certified, you know, that consumer will be willing to pay an extra 20% say for that, that product and on the back end, you know, the growers could get 10 to 20% more for the, for the value of that product by being certified. So I have a question about uh, resources. You uh, uh, talked about a lot of different elements here. Uh, use some comparisons and some of these products. Uh, is that available online at your website, or are there resources that you might point folks to? Yeah, I posted a uh, I posted a written transcript of my talk. Um, it should be live at eleven of what I was going to talk about in this talk, which had a lot of those resources. Um, so yeah, it'll be available, and I may I'm going to add the slides down the road, so we'll have some of those visuals as well. And, and besides you, are there other publicly available uh, resources? The Department of Agriculture, uh, which is doing a number of seminars here, is that a resource that you might recommend? Sure. Yeah, I haven't read a lot. Uh, well, well, the Oregon Department of Agriculture has a wonderful website. Um, I highly recommend going there, and I have the links to that um, in my talk as well. So yes, I do I do recommend that one. The OLCC. Uh, it's the ODA. Yeah, they have a cannabis section, and uh, they also have a pesticide advisory section as well. Um, in addition to that, I also run a forum with uh, Tim Wilson. It's a free forum. There's no advertising on there. It's logicalgardener.org, and it's all uh, primarily science-based horticulture, um, covering a variety of topics from permaculture to gardening. It's not um, necessarily cannabis-focused, but there is a medicinal plant section where there, where there is talk on cannabis cultivation. Yeah. Uh, logicalgardener.org, and it's on uh, it's in the link section on our website too. If you go to kissorganics.com. Other questions? Yeah, can we talk about um, some of the benefits and challenges of growing organically in a tropical climate like South Florida? Oh boy, um, not really. <laughs> I went and gave a talk on compost teas in uh, on Kauai about a decade ago and I found that um, I was totally out of my element because the environment was so different. Um, I think a lot of these principles are still very sound, but in terms of soil structure and, and all the composition and all of that, I could look at a soil test and maybe give you analysis, but um, I'm not as familiar with those areas. So it would be good to connect with someone locally than a local farmer, for example, that's been growing in those soils that could give you more information. Well, what are you talking about? We're talking about that we're contracting with our package is recommending growing organically down there. Okay. Uh, as part of the package. So, and obviously, with the humidity and the heat, um, you know, we're going to have some, I mean, some benefits to the light and the sun yeah. and all that, but obviously, we've got challenges. Yeah. Um, Not really. I found even in Seattle, having a shade cloth over our tomatoes, for example, um, in our greenhouse, made a huge difference in controlling the temperature. And we didn't see any uh, any reduction in growth rate over the tomatoes that were being um, the, in terms of the UV exposure from the other uh, the other tomatoes in our greenhouse. But it wasn't anything that was terribly scientific. It was just an observation. So I would I would tour some tomato greenhouses and how, see how they're controlling, or pepper greenhouses, how they're controlling temperature and humidity. That's really your best resource, I think, yeah. Anyone else? And what booth are you in in case? Oh, here we go. So you mentioned that uh, just growing organically, in general, you know, your plants are healthy and they're more, uh, less susceptible to diseases, but in case you have disease, let's say like uh, russet mites, Yes. What would be your choice of tools to address it? I think it depends on what stage of plant growth you're, you're in. Um, I think keeping a clean room and those protocols are really important. And then uh, having a preventative uh, bug program, which I know you guys 
do as well. Um, it would be a combination of initially doing some spraying, some foliar applications with horticultural oils to control the, and, and maybe knock down the bug population and bringing in some beneficials. Um, and you may find, I think, with organics that the plant is, does have other um, you know, microbial interactions that will help potentially with uh, plant defense. But uh, yeah, it is a challenge. It's not, I'm not saying that uh, growing organically makes all these pathogens go away. It's, it's something that you're still dealing with. But I, I think you can consider still reusing soil um, in facilities, even when you are dealing with a lot of these problems. Because we have had growers that have had everything under the sun. The only thing we haven't found a solution for yet, to be totally honest, is this uh, root nematode. That uh, it's just, once it got a hold in this one garden, we were not able to eradicate it. We had to throw out the soil. But that soil was about four years old, so the grower was willing to do that because they'd still gotten their ROI on it at that point. Um, honestly, the best thing is not don't take in new plants. I can't tell you how many times I hear, oh yeah, I got these from a buddy, this new genetics, and now I have, you name it, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so asking if taking in organic soil can be bad. Definitely. Yes, you can be bring, it's a whole other vector for bringing in insects and diseases. Um, and one thing that you will have to deal with with organic soils is fungus gnats. It's, it's unavoidable anytime you have that amount of organic matter. But those are fortunately really easy to treat and control relative to a lot of these other pests. So it is important that wherever you're getting your soil or um, if you're mixing your own soil, then it's coming from a clean facility or a clean place to where you're not bringing in any, any of these pests and diseases. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's another potential vector, just like anything else. So do you recommend to use uh, some kind of a, a tea as a spray to prevent uh, diseases? You know, there are some people that are foliar feeding with compost teas. Um, I personally use them as soil drenches to increase nutrient cycling. Uh, there's mixed data and research in regards to using them for uh, disease prevention. So I choose not to mention it for that because it also brings up the whole issue of uh, claiming that these teas are pesticidal, which brings in the EPA and a whole lot of regulations. So um, it's worth experimenting with it. The one issue with a lot of these teas too, though, is that they're not, um, they're not consistent. You can't, you're not going to get the same compost tea every time you brew. It's going to be slightly different. And in fact, you can change those microbial communities quite a bit just by adjusting uh, how long you're brewing or what your food source is. So um, there are some studies that show that seaweed has actually helped, um, has contained some uh, pesticidal properties in that regard. But uh, that would be something you want to experiment with. Yeah. Yeah. OK, once again, you tell us what booth you're in and uh, where folks can come find you. Uh, OK, I don't know our exact booth number. 739. I oh, you set me up for that one. Yeah, I did. You so, did. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Tad, for a very informative uh, presentation. Let's hear it. Uh, thank you, Dave.